Support the Amigos podcast and keep the Amiga goodness flowing for just a dollar a month. Visit our page at patreon.com slash Amigos podcast. Amiga, the first personal computer that gives you a creative edge. Amigos, the podcast about everything Amiga. Amigos is a proud member of the Throwback Network, your home for quality retro podcasts. And now, here are your hosts, Aaron Dowdy and John Bodovkar Schaller. Hi everybody, welcome to Amigos. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And today we're going to talk about civilization again. (laughs) That's right folks, we recorded a whole show and I did not have the right audio input selected and it sounded terrible. It so sounded demonic, actually. It did. The, there is something going on with the internal mic in my laptop. Here at Amigo Studios, you've got a glitch. <laughs> so uh, this is, we we have the blue snowball selected. I'm looking at it in Audacity right now. And so we are locked and loaded and ready to go. So we're going to kick things off with the news. Uh, we got some feedback last week. Uh, first thing we got was a message from uh, Jarno Smith, who is starting a new Indiegogo project. Uh what he's trying to do is uh, he's offering a what amounts to an Amiga 1200 case, and this is an officially licensed product by Amiga Inc. Um, has the Amiga kind of etched in and everything, and uh, it looks like a 1200, but inside of it, it's got space for a Raspberry Pi or one of those thin mini ITX uh, boards. So this is kind of a, you know, it's that same kind of old meets new thing where if you are uh, a fan of the 1200 and, uh, but you want a kind of more modern machine, or if you want an emulation machine that, you know, has that retro edge, uh, this could be for you. Uh, He is uh, just not too far in, just a couple weeks into his campaign. Unfortunately, he's only raised about 4,000 euros of the required I'm not sure if it's required or not with Indiegogo. I don't know what the rules are, but he's looking for 90 grand, uh, which is a long way to go. Now, he does have a couple months to get it. Uh, the The case itself is uh, 64 euros, and it is a, um, it's a little unclear, at least it was to me, whether that comes with the keyboard or not. I think just looking over the campaign here, the uh, uh, different levels of, of entry on the Indiegogo will get you different things. I know for 110 euros, you get two cases, I believe, uh, one white and one black, and an internal uh, 1200 keyboard. Okay. So uh, um, now that's just a featured perk, uh, and they get on the list, so they're they're going to change. I know just looking this over, you notice I said internal keyboard because some of these models have <laughs> they look kind of strange. Uh, the uh, they just picture an Amiga 1200 that's just bald it has no keyboard at all it just has a plastic field and they've got a keyboard that sits there that you could pull off i want to say that that there's been a computer that's been like that before maybe it's a an old like an old mac or one of the uh one of the like the pc jr didn't it have some kind of a weird it had, pc jr did have like an infrared keyboard as i recall yeah but it was not popular yeah but, and yeah. i mean i mean it, the keyboard and the pc jr they were, <laughs> this they were pretty much those, hated those chiclet keys i'm sure i'm sure like. this have a much better keyboard one thing uh, that, uh looking at this over is that you can get the case in black which would be neat uh if you're into that sort of thing uh we, me and boat discussed the off air uh many times actually we talked about what the the line between when um, a project like this with an emulated computer crosses, you know, where do you cross a line between a retro computer and, a, and whatever this would be, which would be a, an emulated uh, computer? I don't have a problem with this. Uh, the main reason being the scarcity and the expense of an actual 1200. Uh, we figured that uh, for around uh, 80, 75, 80 bucks American, you could get one of these cases, and then you can get a Raspberry Pi for what, twenty five bucks, yeah. bucks, something like that. Mm-hmm. Stick it in there, and uh, you know, if you consider right now an Amiga twelve hundred in the states, you're probably looking at a ballpark of five hundred dollars, and they ain't going down. If you know no. what I'm saying? Uh, I, I'm glad I got my own for free. Otherwise, I could never have afforded one. So, I you know, I I, I can get behind a, a campaign like this. Like he said, it's got the uh, Amiga, it's got Amiga's endorsement, it's, it's got the Amiga etched right where it should be on the case and the, the case has a lot of advantages to it it's got a lot of extra uh, portage and stuff so i think these will be good now uh, we don't know if 90 
thousand euros is doable. It doesn't that it seems like a high number. Now, granted, we don't know what costs are into the, the development of these cases and making the molds and having them produced. It could be very expensive. I don't know. Uh, but uh, if you're into this sort of thing and uh, you'd like to see something like this made, head on over and, and give these guys some backing because they look they look like a real solid yeah solid case. And like I said, black is always cool. And I'll, I'll put a link up to that in the in the blog, in the show notes. Yeah, I hope that, I hope they make it. Yeah. Um, the next uh, email I got was from our uh, our listener Jonas. Uh, he's written in a couple times before, uh, and he wanted to make us aware that Mayhem, uh, which was uh, an Amiga game that's kind of like a multiplayer Asteroids, uh, that it has been ported over to the Raspberry Pi. And Aaron, um, you were saying that uh, there was an Odyssey game. That, that was kind of like this? I wish I could remember the name of it. Yeah, it's the same sort of affair where you had... I've not played this game, just from hearing the description. It was uh, There was there was gravity involved, and the, the you'd get pulled in. It was multiplayer, some simultaneous multiplayer. So mm-hmm. I really liked it on the Odyssey, too. So this might be fun. We'll have to give this one a shot. Yeah, Earl Green, if you're listening, I know you've got that Odyssey 2 podcast. You can fill us in on uh, what game we're thinking about. Uh, and then the last thing is... Uh, the last uh, email we got this week was from Wendell. And uh, he said, guys, you might appreciate this amazing and inspirational talk about 8-bit computer graphics by Mark Ferrari, who was uh, one of the graphic artists over at LucasArts back in the day. And so I'll post a link to that video. Um, I know uh, Aaron and I both have been big fans of of LucasArts. Uh, I always think about LucasArts from more of the 16-bit, you know, games like Maniac Mansion and... uh, Full throttle and stuff like that, but uh, you started earlier with LucasArts, right? Well, I remember when Ball Blazer and Rescue on Fractalus came out, and they were both really neat, and they were they were both cutting edge, you know. And and um, Ball Blazer is really good on the seven eight hundred, which mm-hmm. is not too many games can say that, right? Uh, one of and the better uh, ports. Um, it, they, they've also got Rescue on Fractalus. It's a, those are both neat games. I got in. I was really into Maniac Mansion, Day of the Tentacle, when those came out too. So those those are fun games. Luke started putting out a lot of quality stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had a Full Throttle was a game that they did, I believe, it was like yeah. a motorcycle, and it was a that was a. They've done some real unique stuff. Oh I'll yeah, give them credit. Even within the kind of same sort of um, you know uh, puzzle adventure game, point and click adventure game series, they really pushed the envelope all the way up until pretty much Grim Fandango. I think that was kind of the Grim last Grim Fandango. Draw. I always heard and so much about that, and I actually played a little bit of it. It was very unique, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. So um, we thank Wendell for that. And uh, our next bit of news that I'd like to share is uh, is confirming Aaron's suspicion <laughs> that um, the theme from Gods was not, in fact, the first computer theme song to be commercially released. Uh, thanks to our reporter on the scene, Dreamcatcher, uh, he wrote up an article about you know all the other tunes that had been and uh, but the earliest one he he I think he said was uh, Koji Kondo, who was the composer of uh, the Super Mario Brothers music. He released uh, that on a seven inch single, uh, which would have been sometime in a eighty three eighty four time period. He that guy uh, Koji's excellent. Yeah, <laughs> obviously legendary. Uh, the uh, you know Dreamcatcher once again. Uh, well done uh, for pointing for the few times I've gotten something right, and you finally jumped behind me here on this. But uh, me and, as me and Boat were discussing earlier, uh, Dreamcatcher always puts out great articles. That was a good article. He's just got a new one out on Andy Davidson, the uh, fellow that created Worms, and it's a it's a real good read. Uh, you, so uh, if you want to have some good stuff to have a look at, head on over to the uh, the podcast webpage there and take a look because he always has good stuff out. He puts stuff out a couple times a week. It's always great. Yeah, that's amigospodcast.com. Okay. Um, Aaron, what news do you have this week? Uh, just a few items. Um, I read. I came across this looking through a forum, and I confirmed it a few other places. If you have a USB rapid road uh, for your Amiga, uh, be careful. <laughs> the uh, Now, what is a rapid road? It's a USB device for for an Amiga. Is this like a GoTek floppy emulator? Not sure. I've never used one. Uh, I know they're 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 for sale at all the big uh, Amiga suppliers mm-hmm. that you know that, uh, they're a pretty popular item, but uh, from on high, just coming from the guys that actually uh, that produce the the item, uh, if you if you hot plug these, you could destroy it. Uh, the uh, the the fellow that makes them has been a stand-up guy and has been replacing them. Uh, but uh, if you have one of these USB rapid road devices, 
uh, you may want to not hot <laughs> hot swap things for the time being until they come out with some official word or uh, a fix, which I'm not sure what could be done, to be honest with you, that would fix something like that. Uh, but uh, we talked that, you know, back in the day, uh, uh, hot swapping was not a thing. And so basically, you could hot swap anything. You, if you pulled even your keyboard out, you could you could screw up your computer or even, I was always afraid to pull out the serial port or the parallel port. So uh, this will take these people back to a bygone era when you can't do that either. Yeah. And, you know, I was thinking about with parallel port, you know, you're pulling out, you know, metal object from metal object and talk about, you know, an opportunity for a short or anything like sure. that. Yeah, it's sure. scary stuff. Yeah. Um, Next little item I had here, and uh, this is just something <laughs> I thought was amusing. I came across an article. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit older, about a year and a half old, but it amused me. Uh, there's a uh, there's an article out, and we'll link it, about this Amiga 2000 that's been running the heating cooling uh, for the Grand Rapids public school system for 30 years. <laughs> have you Did you come across no. this? No. And uh, they have a mentality there, which is that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And this thing has never broken. So it's been running. Think wow. about that. For 30 years, this has ran the heating and cooling for the school system. I don't know how that could possibly work, but uh, it's kind of neat. It shows yeah. the, and I will say Amigas are incredibly resilient. They, you know, I've... I've had very few problems with any of the ones yeah, I've ever had. I mean, most of the ones, most of the problems stem from the, the the disc drive, and you know anything with a with a belt on it is going to wear out over time. But if you're not relying on that disc drive, then those machines will last forever. Yeah. Uh, one last little bit. Um, uh, there's a new game out. Uh, it's been released on AmyNet. It's called Oblet. I believe is the way it's pronounced. It's by James Wilkinson. Uh, it's a top-down dungeon crawler. Uh, it's supposed to be Zelda-esque, all right? So if you're into the Zelda thing, which I am not, but I know a lot of people are, I want to give this a shot and see if it's up your see if it's up your alley. All right, cool. Well, uh, that's it for the news this week. It's time to move on to our game. So today we're going to be talking about civilization. So Aaron's going to fill us in on uh, the specifics of uh, who published it and who wrote it. Well. Uh, Civ, uh, Civilization came out in 1992 for the original chipset, and then they had a version released in 94 for the AGA chipset. Uh, came out, you know, under the uh, under Microprose. Uh, I think we've covered at least one or two Micro. Have we covered any Microprose games? I'm Boy, looking at the list here. I was thinking we did probably looked over one other one or two things, but I'm looking at the list here. Um, I don't remember. Wasn't Marble Madness published by Microprose? Uh, or what about Micro League Wrestling? <laughs> Maybe it was. I don't know. No, no, that was that real obscure company. Yeah. Um, Micro Pro is, is was a huge uh, publisher for Amiga stuff and stuff in general. Just looking over the list of what they did here, they did uh, uh, B seventeen Flying Fortress, which I played that. Um, they did all. They did Civilization, Colonization. They did all the Sid Meier stuff. F um, fifteen Strike Eagle. Uh, Formula One Grand Prix, Gunship. I remember playing that. I remember playing Gunship 2000. Uh, so, oh, and they did UFO Pirates. Did you ever play UFO? That was an interesting game. I don't think so. Yeah, it was, that's that's what that's, that'd be a good it's choice. It's not UFO Enemy Unknown. That's it. Yeah. Is that it? The yeah. Sega Sat or the Sega CD game? Well, it was out before, before, way before that. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you put on the okay. list. Um, this was the uh, Civilization was developed by NPS Labs, which is basically Microprocess, uh, you know, division. The same people, then they did pretty much the Sid Meier stuff as well. And of course, it was designed by Sid Meier. Uh, Sid Meier is just one of we, he was sort of the one of the original rock stars of game. You had your David Crane, you know, your Will Wright and mm-hmm. Sid but Meier. But even, even those guys didn't put, maybe Will Wright, his name was on the box. Well, David Crane, his, he, he was on I there. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe later on, but like I'm looking at the Pitfall box and his name is not on if there. If you look at like the PC verse, like Ghostbusters, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure he's on there. I think, um, Gary Kitchens uh, on some of his stuff. I, I, Activision, you know, sort well, of they was... always, you know, they they were founded on giving the the programmer more credit. And a lot of the games, at least in the twenty six hundred, they're they're prominently featured on the back of the box. But I mean, with Will Wright, and, or I mean, with Sid Meier, it's right there. The font of his name is almost as big as the font of the game. It's funny because just doing some research for this, Sid Meier's was sort of a, a prodigy type guy. I mean, he just he was really he came up and he had a lot of respect and and. They they put his name on there because they thought it would sell yeah more software. I mean that was literally it's like let's put his name on here and see how it does and right. it did it did well you know um, 
he did uh, Civilization and Colonization, which is sort of, I guess, an unofficial sequel. Um, cover Action, F-15, Nighthawk, uh, Pirates, which a lot of people love Pirates, Railroad Tycoon, which I've had a cup of coffee with. That's a little bit too much for me, but yeah, it was a very popular game. And then Red Storm Ride, and they did the Silent Service uh, 1 and 2, which were the submarine games. Which I now, he those. didn't do the other tycoon game, like uh, like Roller Coaster Tycoon. I don't right? think he did okay. those. I don't think he did those. I think he just did a Railroad Tycoon. Um, uh, he didn't do anything like that for the for the Amiga. Um, <clears throat> again, there were these were there were two versions of this. Um, there were four discs involved. So, you could, it's a pretty expansive game, you know, strategy-wise, four-disc mm-hmm. game. Uh, these were one player only, which was... Eventually, that was by design. We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> this game was released on a, on a wide uh, array of systems uh, back in the day. Very popular. They had an Apple Mac version, Atari ST, of course. Uh, the uh, They had a cell phone version. They had the NEC PC-98 had a version of it. Uh, the Super Nintendo. They had a DOS and Windows version. Uh, the Tandy PC uh, slash IBM PC Junior, which they had their own graphics sort of chipset. They had their own version. It's like a 16 color chip uh, version. And then the surprising ones I found were it had a Sega Saturn and a Sony PlayStation version. Yeah, I I don't recall ever seeing uh, either of those anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I've got to look. I'm going to look into that because I just I can't imagine playing this on the on the With Saturn. With a D-pad. You know? Oh, jeez, can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. Because I'm telling you right now, any of these games where you play a mouse with a, we control a mouse pointer with a key with a keypad there uh, with a gamepad, that's no good. No, it's never worked. It's no. never worked. Um, so it was a widely popular, widely released thing. It sold a zillion copies, uh, and uh, uh, that oh, forgot it was also released on the N gauge. I should add that in <laughs> for those of you that are familiar wow. with that. So, what do you think about this? I, how do you explain the gameplay a little bit of this? Well, it's a turn-based, uh, it's a turn-based game where you know you have your your guys, your civilization, your your people. At the beginning of the game, you can choose whether you want to be the Germans, the Egyptians. There's a you know wide variety of, of different uh, ethnicities, I guess you can choose from, uh, and then you choose how many computer opponents you'd like to have, uh, and um, you can choose. I think up to is it up to seven. Is that right? Up seven, to seven or eight. I can't yeah. remember off the top of my head. Um, I think eight, including you, is, is everybody. So, um, But you can choose to only play with one one other opponent. So you take your turn, and then you know your opponent takes his turn. And uh, your opponent is always the computer in the first game. There's no multiplayer in Civilization One with, with real people. Um, what you do is you, uh, you can choose any number of, of actions uh, from you can either settle a city... Uh, you can build a worker. Um, you know your city produces workers. It can, uh, which will you know till the soil and produce crops or whatever. Uh, you can send out scouts to discover new places. Um, you can produce different technologies, which then beget uh, more technologies. Uh, the game works kind of uh, what we recognize now on a skill tree system, where you know you you have these very primitive technologies. For example. Uh, before you can have a constitution, you have to have writing, you know, so you have to come up with writing and maybe before writing, you have to come up with a way of producing ink, ink which, production. Which or I always like love that aspect of the game because it, it built on layers, of, you know, and, and they were, they made sense. You mm-hmm. know, you would learn alphabet, you know, you know develop an alphabet and you might develop a philosophy or you might develop... Uh, you know, bronze working, working, moving to work and making chariots, and you have to have horseback and you know stuff like that. It uh, it requires you to have a thick, uh, beefy manual to keep track of it all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, once you once you uh, had a grasp of what was going on, it made it uh, made it a lot more realistic. Right. The uh, the main gameplay takes place on a, an overhead view map. If you can think about SimCity or something like that but at a much higher scale. You know, when you look down, your city is comprised of basically one block. A square. A square, yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, and the game is very plain looking. It's so plain looking, in fact, you know, when you've got your settler moving around, unless the game told you that was a settler, you would not know. Where the game shines graphically is in these kind of, they're not really cut scenes, they're just kind of interstitial screens where when you build a city, you'll see, you know, 
uh, a still screenshot of your city being built and it looks really cool um, and then you know as your city grows you'll see it you'll see it mature and grow and when you build different wonders or when you come into contact with other civilizations and you meet representatives you'll see those and those are drawn in a very high fidelity style uh, the game also has a really impressive introductory sequence that's kind of like the book of Genesis where it talks about there was void and then the, the plants came and the waters cover the earth and all this stuff. And there's really kind of evocative music that, 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 that plays behind there. It's a neat tune. It's yeah, a really it's, tune. it's really cool. Uh, unfortunately, after the introduction, the music stops and there's no more music the rest of the game. And this game, because it is, uh, you know, you are really there'll be turns in this game where you're literally just waiting around for your thing to get built because you don't have enough things going on it would have been nice if they would have played something soft in the background but uh like aaron uh was saying the first time we recorded this um <laughs> it was probably due to the fact that this was a port from the pc version and at this time you know there the the, the sound blaster was not really that popular in 1990 no i have read that cd you know cd releases of this have that uh, was a red book audio tracks uh -huh. that will play. So that that's nice. Yeah. Uh, if they, of course, obviously the Amiga didn't get it released like that, but in, in other versions, they they did realize that having no sound was probably a bad way to go. Of course, right. so limitations of what of what they had to work with as well. Yeah. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the PC, since the PC spawned this game, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what the reason was. But the original, the opening, the opening song. Is 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 really good, and and it's a shame that uh, that you don't get more of that. That's mm -hmm. that's a fact. Yeah. So, what did you think of this game, Aaron? <clears throat> I really dug it. Back when I was a, a, a younger man, so many years ago, and when this first came out, I had it on the on my Tandy one thousand TL, uh, and uh, uh, now I, I've been meaning to ask this. The Tandy is not the same as the TRS, right? That's correct. The okay. uh, the, the TRS eighty Coco. Uh, is a uh, was a uh, different machine where I mean it was an actual its own machine you know it had its own OS on mm -hmm. it. the uh, the Tandy series had uh, were basically clones oh, just PC but clones. they had uh, specifically made front ends for example that I, they had a thing called DeskMate I remember built into my TL and it would come up and it was very it looked like Windows mm -hmm. it was it was hard it was on a chip you know it wasn't software mm -hmm. and it would come up but uh, it I never, I don't never saw it get supported that much, and it eventually, I don't know if they were angling to make this like Windows or if it was just a clone or it's that it wasn't a clone. I mean, it was a rip off. I guess mm -hmm. a better way to put it. But uh, the Tandy One Thousand series had usually had their own Tandy graphics, which were sort of somewhere between EGA and VGA. Okay, you know, and so this is, so this looked probably about the same as I recall. I mean, when I played this this past week. I wasn't I wasn't like oh god it looks great or oh it looks horrible it looked about the same mm -hmm. you know and that seems to be a common trait with these ports they sort of look kind of the same they I'm sure the Amiga version sounds better uh, the uh, the than the uh, PC version obviously but uh, um, I used to love this game I played the heck out of it strategy games weren't really my bag because I have sort of a short attention span but uh, I dug it I really like the way you you build your civilization I mean. The interaction with the other with the other civilizations in the game, it's a mixed bag. The concept is cool, you know. Go after these guys, have a war with them, you know, fight them or make peace with them, or you know, be, remain a neutral party in certain situations. But the uh, one of the one of the small failings of the game is that the uh, your allies in this game or your enemies they'll turn on on a on, on the turn on uh, the drop of a hat. They'll turn on you for no reason. They'll they do weird stuff. They're unpredictable, you know, and uh, so that makes it that kind of on that area, it's okay. the The area that it really shines is the development of your civilization. You get to pick what your scholars look into. You get to pick what your your people build as wonders of the world, and you feel a, a sense of accomplishment when you build something magnificent. Your people are happier. You, you know, it, it's cool looking. That when your palace gets upgraded because your people are happy, it makes you feel. It makes you feel good because you're like, man, I'm doing it. I've, I've, I get to pick the what my palace right. looks it, like. It's it's really all the fun of Sim City, except with a lot more direction because yes. there is a win state. There is a win condition. Yeah. 
Um, and, you know, the win state could either be you've destroyed all the other, you know, civilizations through military conquest, or you've achieved a cultural victory by building so many wonders. There's many ways to win in SimCity and... Uh, SimCity? Or, yeah, in, in civilization. <laughs> and um, we forgot to mention that the way that the turns go, each turn that you take, you have a kind of a, a year up in the corner. And I think at the beginning, the years go by much more quickly. Maybe every turn is 100 years or something like that. But as you edge closer to the modern day, the, the years go by more slowly. You know, I meant to ask you, I, I, saw this refer, I saw this game referred to as a 4X type strategy game. Right. Okay. I don't know what that means. 4X means explore, exploit. There's two other X kind of things. But the, 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 that's what they... There's a lot of games that are like this where you're, you know, you're, you're trying to explore different lands, you interact with different people, you go to war with them, and something else. And um, 4X games are, uh, they're like their own genre now. There's so many, but Civ was really the first one. I cannot think of it, uh, a one. I mean, maybe Utopia on the Intellivision. Uh, you know, might have had it was an early version of a, of a 4X game. You you've played that a lot more than I have. Um, you know, were you exploring in the same way as you have the fog of war kind of, and then you know you're branching out? Yes, to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so one thing about Civ that threw me off back in the day is, oh, as a as a younger man again. I had seen Civilization, the board game, uh, in stores well before I saw the video game. And for the longest time, I just thought it was a straight-up conversion of the, of the... Sort of like the the Gold Box games do, you know, the where they took the D&D system and they sort of, I mean, sort of along those lines. So, I, But it, it wasn't, uh, apparently. Uh, Myers did admit to borrowing, uh, quote, in quotes, many of the uh, technological tree ideas from the board game and uh, the game that game came out in in, in the UK in 1980, so this, it would have out many years before yeah. before the uh, before the game. But I thought it was interesting. One of the things I found out about the, when when Civ uh, the, the video game was in release early on, uh, they would often include a uh, a flyer in it about ordering information for the board game. So, but apparently, I, don't, I think I even read somewhere there may have been a lawsuit involved hmm. uh, in, in this, but. Uh, Apparently they were trying to give them some some um, some love back in the day. Maybe, yeah, maybe that maybe that was the some of the terms that they settled and they said, well, we'll put a flyer in for your board game if you let us call this thing civilization. Yeah, it's it's funny you should mention uh, 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 Utopia. Uh, I was reading some some background on how civilization came to be made. Uh, Meyer was actually the third major designer that had thrown his hat in on Civ. Uh, they had a couple other people that, for various reasons, left. And the first one was Danielle Bunton Berry, which the, the, the fellow slash who's now a lady uh, uh, that made Mule. Uh, in, but way, way back in 83, very popular game, which uh, I, I've i not played for years and years, but, I mean, people still play it. They love it. Mm-hmm. So have you ever played Mule? Oh, I love Mule. Great song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the one thing I do remember is this dun, awesome da, 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 Yeah. It's dun, great. Dun, dun, dun. Yep. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, Barry ended up opting to do another game. Things happen. They didn't get to come back and work on it. The next fellow that, that they offered to uh, work on Civilization, Don Daglo, the designer of Utopia. Which I thought was interesting because Utopia is widely considered the first simulation game, and it was out on the Intellivision. It's amazing what it did with a, a system like the Intellivision when you're talking, you know, pretty low end, right? Uh, you know, but uh, he ended up uh, getting offered the executive position, an executive position at Broad, uh, Broaderbund. He never came back to the game, and so finally, uh, Sid Meier sort of inherited Civilization. He's the one that finally got it done. Mm. So I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, the reason he went with a, a, a turn-based system, he thought it, uh, to make it real time, it would be it would feel too much like a lot of other games that were out at the time, including a, your, your uh, Sim Cities and one. So he thought he thought turn-based would be the way to go to give it a different feeling. Um, people often wonder why this didn't have multiplayer. Um, it did uh, in design. Uh, Meyer admitted it uh, because. The computer used alliances too effectively, and it would make it feel like that the computer was cheating. And well, that doesn't make sense though, because you're talking about how could, why would he take out the ability to have a second player that you're playing against? 
like another human player. From what I've from what I've read, uh, the addition of extra players would cause the game to run in a way that would make them that would make it uh, almost impossible to play. I, and I, I assume it's some way that the AIs put. I don't I don't know. I have specifics on it, mm-hmm. and so. That in, that got omitted early on. Now, as I recall, there was, and you back me up on this boat. Didn't there wasn't there something called CivNet that came out that had multiplayer civilization? I believe there was. That sounds really familiar. Yeah, and that I, sounds really I, familiar. I, I wish I looked into it now, mm-hmm. but I believe it came out shortly. I think it predated Civ Two mm-hmm. and had multiplayer uh, civilization. Because I know for a lot of people, that's the only way they'll play Civilization because. They figured out a way to min-max the game against the computer opponents, and it's really you know the only way they can get a challenge is by playing a real. Yeah, game. and there are tricks. Mm-hmm. There are things you can do with like you can build mines and turn. You can do stuff that you aren't supposed to be able to do. There are exploits yeah. with, with you know which uh, that does. If you know those, it does pretty much kill that 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 game. Yeah, and that's really what killed. Both times that I've played Civilization, I try and play as much as I can without reading anything online. Because I know as soon as I go online and they say, well, this is the way to win every time, then the game's done for me. Yeah, that, al- even bother playing. that always stinks yeah. when a game, especially if it's a game you really like. And mm-hmm. I, it's okay if you stumble across these things. But, I mean, if, if, you, if, you know, if you can do them every time, it's like there's plays in Mad and you can run over and over and over right. and always work. Eh, well, what's the point of playing them again? Yeah, I remember with Civ Four. When I was living in England, when I was in grad school, that was when I was really into it. And I actually printed out, like, you know, talk about, that game doesn't need a manual, but I printed out this, like, 40-page strategy guide and a binder that I'd have, and I was looking <laughs> at stuff. And I was real into Civ Four. Well, Civ Four was, was a good game. Uh, it was a far cry from this one in many ways. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, Civ was uh, ported off the PC. And so... Um, at the time, PC was still a lot. Most PCs were still in the EGA era, sixteen color, and so to when they when they made the game, they had to take that into consideration, and so uh, they were they were going to limit the amount of uh, the amount of variable map things in to sixteen because to to cope with the sixteen colors, and they ended up going down to eight. You know, yellow, white, cyan, blue, green, gray, magenta, and that was the reasons for that were the limitations of the video because you had. If you had multiple items on the menu that were the same color, that's going to get real confusing real quick. And mm-hmm. so they ended up narrowing it down. So I think that's kind of neat to think that that the, back in those days, you had to think about the limitations of, of what your user was going to be uh, having to deal with because you couldn't, you know, you had to make it so the game was playable just yeah. on a certain video card. Or, Absolutely. You know. So, uh, uh, and I'm sure there were plenty of games that had those uh, had those same limitations that they, that they made it work, mm-hmm. you know. So I always thought that was kind of cool, but overall, uh, it's I always like Civ. It's a fun game. Uh, I tried to play it this time without any manual, and it, and it was almost impossible. Yeah. Uh, without the without the play manual, uh, and I, as I mentioned about earlier, when, when I originally had this on the PC, I I had a liberated copy, and this one I remember this one of the first games where I had to liberate the manual. I had to go out and get my buddy's manual and photocopy the whole thing because otherwise you. Not just for the copy protection, which you can get around that, but just uh, just to know what the hell is going on. Because mm-hmm. there's there's keyboard shortcuts that are not immediately apparent. Absolutely. Um, and you 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 have to know. You just yeah. have to. Well, um, what about what's going on with this game in the secondary market? Well, not much <laughs> actually. I I had a chance to look this up on on eBay, and it uh, it's not there. It's not available on the on the Amiga uh, right now. Now, in the last six months, there have been a few copies sold, and they they sold for around twenty seven in between twenty seven and fifty bucks uh, U.S. But uh, I, I was surprised because this this game was a huge seller. Uh, it was it was uh, it was widely regarded as one of the all time great games. Certainly, all time great strategy game. Maybe maybe the all time great. Uh, it's in a lot of top top game lists Mm -hmm. it's in a lot of top amiga lists it was it was well received it scored high in uh in reviews you know i don't think i saw any reviews where it scored under you know 80 percent and a lot of them weren't scored in the 90s so you you would think that a game that sold that well was so popular would be uh, readily available in the market but it was just not there 
it's funny here recently as I've noticed that some a lot of the games we've looked at aren't available on on eBay, which is surprising to me. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this happens to be one you don't see that often. So if you've got a hold of a copy, hold on to it because I'd say the price is probably going to go up. Absolutely. All right. Well, um, let's talk about what we want to play for next week. So, uh, what do you think about doing another Bitmap Brothers game like Speedball Two Brutal Deluxe? I would love to give that a shot and hand you your ass, sir. <laughs> well, we'll see about that when we take the field. Is Speedball 2 played on a field? No, it's more like a weird metal building. When we take the weird metal building. That's right. Um, so we'll do that next week. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors. We picked up a couple new sponsors this Yay. week. Yay. Uh, Colbjorn Barman and Mark McDonald. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to thank our other sponsors, Adam Bradley, Chris Folds, Will Williams, Zach Nope. Zach Zimmerman, Daniel Bingston, O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, Chad Halstead, and Brent Dowdy. How could you get that? How could you get that first name and I then just, not get the Zach one? I was just so eager to go on to Zach Zimmerman because uh-huh. I love alliterative names. It, it so. does. It does roll off the yeah. tongue. Uh, so anyway, if you want to join uh, this list of our uh, guys that help keep this show on the air, uh, just head over to Patreon.com/slash Amigos Podcast, and uh, we'll see you next week. Until then, adios. adios.